our next talk is going to be deterministic firmware with Nix. Let's welcome Oli. All right. How are you doing? Doing well. Enjoying the first day of NixCon. Uh, I wanted to do a little bit of a different of an intro because uh, we've been sitting all day and we might be a little bit tired. So I think we should just uh, stand up, everyone, and do some light stretching. All right. Are you ready? So just follow my lead. Just do like this. Tilt your head to the to your right, to the left. And then we can do some swirls like this. Just getting it, getting the body awake. We have to remember we also have a body. And then the other side, like this. All right, you're doing great. And then the hands, your right hand forward. And then you can type it like that. Many of you have a carpal tunnel? No, no not now. <laughs> And then like this. All right, and then the left hand. Like this. How much do we got left? Yeah, we have 45 seconds, no worries. And then here. And then now it's for the, those of you that stand close to each other, we do like this. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> and just like this. And then to the, your left. Uh, just, as long, just as far as you want. Or your body allows you today, then up, and a little bit further up. Nice. And then the other way. Okay. Okay, and let's just drop it a bit. All right, how are you feeling now? Yeah, good. Nice. All right. So, uh, yeah, so uh, my name is Ole. Uh, uh, I've been writing firmware now for around nine years, uh, all different versions, assembly, C, C++, and more recently Rust, which has been a really f refreshing uh, experience. Uh, I've been a Nix enthusiast now for more than two years. Um, got into Nix a little bit because of build system related to firmware. I think some of you that have experienced that kind of know firmware build systems are Rough. Uh, I've been, I've been uh, building my company Genki now for 10 years, and I've been Icelandic for 32 years. I took this picture outside my window last week. Sometimes it gets really nice in Iceland. Um, yeah, so Genki. Uh, we make these uh, instruments and these controllers. I'm wearing one, it's called Wave, it's a ring. And this is Pedro, he uh, plays saxophone and, and uh, and flute for Hans Zimmer, and he's using it to like add effects by moving his instrument around. Um, he is uh, playing it, for example, in Dark Phoenix and Dunkirk, and touring all over the world. And like, we have like thousands of people like like him doing uh, these interesting things with these small controllers. Um, and I just want to show you a really quick video. I don't know if we have sound now. Yeah. Okay. We don't have sound. Mm -hmm. Oh. Uh, yeah. The other thing I really like about uh, the, the precision of this ring is you can do things like with a, like a small things inside this gigantic scale. So let's say we have a violin line. And has an abrupt end. And this is natural. You, you can coordinate with your hands like... It's like adding this, you know, movement and, 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 and emotion into your playing. And he, he's composing a lot of music for video games and stuff like that. So uh, it's really re rewarding when you've actually, you know, built something like that to see it out in the, out in the wild. So, uh, so these are a number of our products. We have the ring. We have the, this uh, thing in the middle is uh, what's called a Eurorack receiver. It kind of pipes the output of the ring into your synthesizers. And then we have MIDI Master, which is another company that makes this, and it allows you to get the data directly into your synthesizers through MIDI. And there's firmware everywhere. In all of these devices, there's a bunch of firmware that needs to be written and uh, maintained and tested and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that kind of leads to the next question. Why Nix? Uh, well, um, like I said, like I, I arrived at Nix through kind of 
thinking there must be a better way to do computing, <laughs> like, uh, how, like how we did it. And I think this has to do with a lot of, uh, a lot of people is that we, uh, a lot of uh, developers that are just starting out, uh, they will just have, you know, if it builds on my machine, it's good. And we used to do that for many years. We have the firmware, it's built on my machine. I just push it to my clients from my machine. Uh, but that, of course, not scalable. And as the team grew, it became very clear that this was not the way forward. Uh, so the first thing that Nick's kind of uh, teaches you is that uh, it kind of forces you to look at the way of how the build system and like bring all the dependencies that you're actually using to like uh, that goes into your build into one place, right? Um, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but bear with me. Uh, deterministic builds. Uh, deter determinism is a kind of, a, it's hard to define and it has something to do with free will and it's way above my pay grade, so I won't try to define it. Uh, but in, all in, all, in kind of practical terms, it means that if I am uh, using uh, uh, my computer to build the firmware, I can assume it to, and I use, uh, in this case, Nix to build it, I can assume that we build it uh, more or less the same tomorrow. And more or less, it's a huge leap from like it builds on my machine, you know, just because I have some stuff and some path set somewhere to actually saying it will more or less, although it's maybe not bit by bit, but it's like in the same ballpark. That's, that's huge. And that's not how firmware devel development is done in the world today, more or less. Uh, we also do it for the environment. Uh, I have, I, now I just CT into my firmware directory and it just spawns a new uh, development shell. I have every, all the paths set, all the stuff I need. I just do Nix build, build the firmware, no, flash, flash the firmware. Like you have no idea how much magic this would have sounded to, to me like eight years ago. Like we had to spend weeks to set up like exactly the right stuff on my computer just to be able to, to inter, interact with, a, with this device over uh, OC, open OCD or something like that. Uh, and the fourth point is that Nix packages is kind of like the sin eater of open source world. And I'm just going to play a short video. I really like this uh, term here. Oh, like the, like, like, like Nix packages is terrified because it's like collected all the stuff and all its tech debt and put it in one spot. Um, it's, it's like the sin, sin eater is a phrase I've learned lately. It's, it's the sin eater of the open source world. It's just like collected all that pain. And, 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 you know, made it appear, made it code and not just like vibes out in the ether and put it down and you can see it and you can feel it. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's awe inspiring in the positive and negative senses of the word. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm kind of going to go to take that and, and, and trademarking that as you adopt Nix and you become the sin eater of your team. So, you know, you take all the stuff, the, the stuff that's like, somebody knows how to set up and makes work, you adopt that and put that into something that's feasible, you can touch, you can see, and, uh, and I'm, I'm gonna show you code a little bit and you can see exactly what I mean. So this is an artist's intention of a sin eater. And this is the next slide. Yeah, so talking about sin eaters, this is the next uh, 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 expression to build our firmware today. <laughs> yeah, thank you. You can just see the pain. <laughs> and like you notice a lot of things like when you start looking into it, like, and I, I, I know that we are not like the best developers in the world, but I think like a many people that go through this uh, project, like just the amount of stuff that you're including to build firmware is absurd here. Like you have like this, for example, this juice framework, uh, it's a cross platform GUI framework to build some firmware. This is our firmware. I wrote this code, you know, it's still, it's absurd. Uh, and all this stuff, like for example, with the Nordic NRF SDK, like uh, we, we download it from some source here and we actually make it so it's a fixed output derivation. So we know that it, you know, it, it will remain the same. But then like we have to run this command here. Okay, so we copy it into the source. We see what the source, ah, then we just remove this micro ECC because it can't be there. Because we're using another version of, uh, of uh, micro ECC, which is defined here. And like our firmware will not work unless this code is like exactly like that. And for years, we just had to do it. It just had to work out. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Make this deterministic. Okay. Yeah. Oh my God. Okay. Anyways, 
So yeah, and, and uh, some other stuff here that like I won't go into. Like you can just see it. It was very painful to write this, but now it builds. We have something that works, and we'll, we can make sure that it definitely works again tomorrow. Contrast that with modern build systems like Rust. This is for a new product that we were developing, and the build system. Uh, you can just see that there's been a lot of these. A lot of the developers have taken this pain upon themselves when writing the build system and making it in such a way that we can just consume it on this, uh, in this Nix expression. So the only thing that this does is that we have a written Rust toolchain because we're cross-compiling. So we define it here. We overwrite it using, we're using cranelib, so we overwrite the, the default toolchain file. This is just some code because we have a, like a monorepo and we have different subfolders, subfolders inside them. Uh, so the workspace isn't there yet, like Floakley was talking about before. And then uh, we just define the packages like that. And this is the only thing that I need to do to define an X expression. Contrast that with this. So firmware build systems have definitely evolved a lot. And this is a super secret picture of something that we're building next. Uh, haven't shown this to anyone before, but now, now you saw it. So at this point in time, um, <laughs> so uh, a core part of our kind of firmware development suite is just this Nix flake check. And it makes sure that everything builds. We have a Nix, Nix uh, expression, and then the checks make sure that everything builds. It will, you can format it, use a Nix format, or use a tree format for linting it. Uh, runs tests, and all of this can be run on my development machine first and foremost. Like if I have unit tests that are running some kind of business, like testing the business logic, et cetera. But all of the, the rest is then done in impure effect. So we need to flash it to some device, et cetera. So I just want to show you like one of the ways that you can achieve that using Hercules CI. Uh, you define the CI system, where you just have a M2 mini in the office somewhere running this Hercules CI. Uh, here we have an effect, and it uploads the firmware. We pass through uh, the devices that are needed into this run container. And then uh, you flash the firmware using packages that is defined elsewhere in the flick. So it's pretty simple, right? And this way, you can just define these kind of uh, CSCT uh, pipeline read declaratively all in Nix, which is kind of amazing. Um, so yeah, this was kind of uh, majority of my talk. I would like to say a couple of thank yous uh, to the NixOS organizers. And I think we should really just give them a hand of applause for organizing this today. This is really a fantastic, fantastic uh, meeting. The Nix community, like, I, f I feel that uh, Nix has really made me a much better developer, as you can see in my progress from, <laughs> from the C++ build systems that I wrote eight years ago to the Rust stuff that I'm writing today. Um, uh, Matt Krugan, a shout out to Matt. He's uh, been a great friend and, and source of inspiration to learning Nix. And I think, I think all of us that are starting out in Nix, we kind of need somebody like Matt to show us a lot of it, unfortunately, at this point. But I'm very grateful for Matt. Uh, my team at Genki and my wonderful girlfriend Andrea that I think is watching. Uh, yeah. Nick's, Nick's moderation team in action. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, let me give you this microphone so you don't have to fiddle around with yours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you prefer that. Questions? More of an ask, could you go back to the slide before Cineators? You listed four things that you liked about Nix. I just want to read the exact text. Yeah, 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 of course. And you're right. Great, thanks. Yeah, so the uh, the image at the end there was actually a lasciless, but it's kind of hard to see because of the contrast. So uh, is it possible we could make that more visible? <laughs> no. <laughs> 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 but for anyone who doesn't know, this was a photo at uh, Nick's camp, and it is uh, actually Lasselus in front of a burning fire. But uh, we can't see that because of the contrast. Yeah, so. but it was also really funny because he just asked me not to put more, uh, uh, more uh, wood on the fire, but I did anyways. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm going to find a, a good photo, and uh, I'll send this in the Nixcom Matrix channel so everyone can see it. Yeah. So in your CI CD, you flash one device with your firmware, and do you do anything else afterwards? Just check if it responds or something? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, this is like a really, really uh, deep topic and you can go very deep into like what you should do. But I think for now we flash the firmware and then we can, you know, read from the device, read that is sure that it's the, the, the right, um, the, the right uh, like uh, 
codes that we get back from the ROM and stuff like that, and then we can connect to it via Bluetooth, we can communicate with it. Like, uh, for example, here the ring is connected to this, uh, our software, we can essentially emulate the software to send it, you know, presets and make sure that it stores them in Flash. Like, all of this stuff is just, we can just write them declaratively one after another. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that there are other build systems, like Hercules CI is very nice to work with, but I know that there are, like, you can, of course, write it using GitHub Actions, or I, heard, I hear that uh, BuildBot Nix is also going to have, uh, you know, uh, effects soon where you can actually just write Nix code to, to do uh, impure effects. We're uh, way ahead of schedule. Thanks, by the way. For yeah, <laughs> my pleasure. <laughs> so much on time. I was worried. <laughs> but now we don't have to worry. So uh, I guess ask away. But only if you, you can. Got... Al you can also just find me. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Threads. So what I've seen in the Rust ecosystem mm -hmm. uh, is that it's actually, like, the problem I've seen sometimes is People say they're using Rust, but then they're actually just wrapping some C library, or they're mm -hmm. <laughs> they're pulling thing things in that they don't know about. And I think Nix is a really nice way mm -hmm. uh, of like identifying that and, mm -hmm. and realizing that even. Um, and I I'm wondering, since you didn't have to depend on any native stuff uh, in your mm -hmm. build scripts, do you deliberately make an effort to just uh, not do that or mm -hmm. is it just that everything you do is like standalone and you don't depend that much on third-party code what, uh, what are your thoughts on that yeah yeah i think i mean there's a lot of third-party code that we do depend on but it's in the kark toml file so all the you know the dependencies are there and then we have uh, nix can the crane can basically read those this in the lock file together and create the dependency graph that it uses this internally uh, but I, I, but I, that's a good point uh, with, regard, with respect to the the Rust, like relying on just some C code somewhere. Uh, we are, have been using a library called Embassy, Embassy, and that they are rewriting it so that you can do firmer development as async. So all the code is basically written from the, the ground up, and all the SDKs for all the different uh, chips is then maintained inside you know different uh, crates, and compare that to just a zip file on somebody's. Uh, uh, website that you just have to depend on. That's a huge uh, leap of uh, uh, kind of uh, usability. Um, yeah, and, and also just using the async, uh, like the firmware, it just lends itself really nicely to this async await functionality, like you're waiting for something uh, to finish or, you know, you want to put your, you want to be in sleep mode as much of the, mo most of the time, so, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. When using a vendor's product, uh, do you find that you have to be the sin eater for them sometimes? Uh, can you repeat that? When using a vendor's product, mm -hmm. and there's not a Nix package for that, Yeah. do you find that you have to be the sin eater sometimes? Uh, not really, no. Like, it's been mostly abstracted away from me, especially like in the in the uh in the the rust ecosystem in, in particular but like you could saw with the with the big nix expression that we had for the firmware we all, we are just bolting that in as as finite output uh, derivations so yeah okay so it's it's being done by rust but if this was some yeah, like for oh, example, yeah. if you want to build, if you want to cross compile like ARM code in Linux, Linux packages, you just have to, there's already a, a module that you can just import and put into your, your native build inputs and then automatically uh. it will, you know, figure it out. But mm -hmm. it's also, but it's kind of weird because you were using CMake as a build system and there you have a toolchain file and that kind of says that it has to have these and this and this binaries available, but Nix makes them available to the CMake. Yeah. But it's but there's a good distinction there because like with these C build systems, everybody has to be very specific, and you kind of create everything yourself. Whereas whereas with Rust, it's kind of like everybody has the same experience, and it's like shareable and much more easier yeah. to work with. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Thanks for the context. Yeah, yeah, my pleasure. Uh, you mentioned cargo workspaces, which are. Right, because you can have mm -hmm. workspace dependencies. Mm -hmm. um, have you found any way to resolve this issue in Flakes? So when you have sub-Flakes, you want to have 
like your workspace flag dependencies. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, I've never found a way to like work around this. With. Yeah, exactly. Like that's that's the that's the reason why we are why we are writing this code over here. Like uh, this code. This is the the. I mean, it's it's kind of gnarly, but it kind of does the job. So it's just a function, and I think I stole it from uh, from Kenji. <laughs> actually uh, but uh it's it's just a function that kind of like it goes into the directory the source and, and changes the source root variable in the nix build so you have it every, everything is like feels like it's in in its own directory like the sub modules no, I, I meant more in a sense of a sub flake not 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 a sub uh crate like in a, the crate in the okay. um in the cargo workspace but a a flake in a flake workspace, something like this, where you have, for example, a sub package, which is a self, uh, a flake itself, which mm -hmm. has its own input puts, mm -hmm. but also has inputs from the flake, of like from like the root flake in the flake workspace, where you basically have a flake and then a sub flake, and the sub flake can depend on the inputs from the root flake. Yeah, there. I think there are several. M maybe uh, Kenji can allude to that, but I think like there are several ways to do it, like flake parts, for example, where you can kind of have a similar um, setup as um, as the next module system uh, uh, in, inside the Flake scenario. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, you can't. I mean, there is Flake parts, but you can't define inputs in Flake parts, which is kind of nice, but not nice. But uh, thank you for the um, for the. Yeah, we can we, uh, we can discuss answer. it further afterwards. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes. I see you're wearing the Skanky ring, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you have a demo? Could you demonstrate? Uh, oh, do you want to see how it works? Yeah, I would yeah, love yeah. to. Sure. Okay. So, wow, put on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you can see here, I'm moving my, my hand and I can do, for example. Okay. Okay. How do we do this? I can just, you can hear me. Okay, yeah, so. Oh, <laughs> right. So you can see here. Uh, can you hear me? Can you see my hand? But you can't hear it in the audio. Uh. I can move my hands like this, and it will change the sound. And you can see it like that. So I can map these things and yeah, control this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Built using Nix. <laughs> if there are no more questions, I guess we can give our speaker another round of applause.